Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Broadcom. My name is Cody J. Brown, host of TechStrong Learning. We've got an exciting panel ahead of us, but before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping notes. First, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, or you'd just like to share it with a friend, you will be offered the on-demand to view afterwards. Um, on the right side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab, as well as a chat tab. We want you to utilize these two tabs to talk with each other, to talk with us, and uh, use the Q&A to send us any questions you might have throughout today's program. We're going to get to those, as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. And finally, at the end of the presentation, we will have a giveaway for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So stick around to see if you're one of our four lucky winners. But onto our topic today, it is Enterprise DevOps Series, GitHub for Mainframe Demo. And I'm joined today by Phil Holleran, uh, Field CTO at GitHub, and Vaughn Marshall, Product Lead at Broadcom. And it is my pleasure at this time to turn the floor over to Phil to get us started. Phil, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Cody, and thank you everyone for coming. So uh, happy to kick this off again. My name is Phil Holler, and I'm the America's Field CTO at GitHub, and let's just launch right into our agenda for today. We're going to cover a couple of things. We're going to start by talking about kind of the mainframe app dev challenges that exist. We're going to talk about the modernization opportunity to address those challenges and show exactly what that looks like in a live demo, and then have an opportunity for some Q&A at the end. So let's talk a little bit about those uh, challenges. And if, like me, you're coming from a distributed background, you might be wondering, hey, why are we talking about this mainframe stuff? And if you're from a mainframe background, this is probably old news to you. But for folks that are kind of questioning this, really, when we're talking about this and looking at mainframe apps, we're talking about the mission critical systems of record for organizations that have got a lot of high value, high volume transactions. And for many of these organizations, these workflows uh, have a significant compliance component attached to them and any deviation from that prevents, presents a significant risk toward achieving that compliance. So there's a strong need to make sure that these things are as stable and secure as possible so that with enough precision to make sure that all of those computations can be uh, processed without any sort of deviation. And when we're kind of talking about the challenges and in terms of maintaining those, Really, what we're really looking as we think about it is, well, the three real trends that we're seeing. One, of course, is the digital disruption that's happening. As business demands continue to accelerate, it requires faster and quicker changes to, to applications to deliver value to end users and to customers. And those changes that are in place often require many cross-platform application architectures and changes. Delivering something via a mobile app requires a change to the app, to the API layer, and perhaps to the mainframe that's in the back end, handling all of those transactions. All of this presents a significant talent issue, especially as a lot of career mainframers exit the labor force and retire. The new folks or folks that are you know, existing in IT right now really don't have an interest in, in adopting or learning legacy tools to maintain mainframe code. Those traditional practices and tools that exist in the mainframe world don't exactly translate to the skills that they have or the skills that those folks are looking to, to build and, and use throughout their career. So there's really a need to apply these modern DevOps principles and tools and practices to this robust you know, backend mainframe code that is going to continue to power businesses for the foreseeable future. And we need to be able to meet these expectations of increased productivity and velocity while maintaining the security, the robustness, and the reliability that those mainframe applications deliver. So as we kind of talk about those tools that, that are familiar to existing mainframers, that, but not familiar and not really as, as interesting to folks that are being asked to take on the, the opportunity to maintain those applications, on the mainframe side, we're talking really about those centralized, specialized tools for authoring code for managing code and ultimately automating and deploying it. So whether we're talking about you know, a 3270 or you know, Endeavor for version control and automation, those are tools that are really mainframe specific. But when we take a look at more of a modern approach, it's looking at kind of the decentralized world and seeing that the IDEs can be varied. You know, we can use something like VS Code or GitHub Code Spaces, which we'll talk about more here in just a moment. 
uh, version control in Git with solutions like GitHub and automation through actions to communicate with other systems. And of course, the ability to script in any modern programming language, whatever that might be, JavaScript, Python, Bash, Gulp, et cetera. I talked about GitHub code spaces, and so I want to briefly talk a little bit more about what those are. And really, what a GitHub code space is, is a cloud-hosted developer environment. We're really not talking about a VDI here. It's not a desktop that you remote into. It's a network isolated VM that spins up. It's running Docker and can run one or more containers. And it gives you an entire developer environment hosted. So I can use a browser and connect to VS Code with all of my extensions, including those extensions necessary for maintaining mainframe code, like the Zoe extensions and COBOL code completion and syntax highlighting. I can define all of that as code so that every single person who needs to jump in and maintain that application gets the same standardized developer environment with the same extensions, the same configurations. And then any individual terminal preferences or things like that that an individual developer has are layered in on the top. And it allows for folks to code where and when and how they want. Again, in a browser connected to VS Code, or maybe I'm launching my local IDE VS Code. I don't want to work in a browser, and I can just connect to that remote developer environment. Or I can SSH directly in if I want to stay on the command line and use Vim or Emacs or something else like that. For folks that are career mainframers, this kind of might sound like a bit of a back to the future type statement where we're going back to a, you know, a, a terminal to a remote hosted environment that's connected to our mainframe that manages all the code. Uh, everything old is sometimes new and better again with, with code spaces. So why did we create this and, and what problems are we really trying to solve? Well, we had a challenge where it took you know, hours to get a new developer up to speed on a project to configure the machine, make sure you have all the dependencies in place, run the install scripts, clone the code, get it up and running. And that doesn't necessarily scale well across tens, hundreds, or thousands of developers. So with GitHub Code Spaces, our core developers at GitHub are able to click a button and in 15 seconds jump in and be contributing code to our core code base. And then if they need to switch to work on another microservice, another application with a different tech stack, it's another 15 seconds and a button click to jump in and be productive. I don't have to worry about local environment conflicts, configuration issues, any of those types of things. And, and we've fully embraced that here. And we see our customers in the community continuing to embrace the productivity benefits that a, a standardized hosted developer environment can provide for development teams. Okay, so I, I'm going to jump in here, and uh, so so thanks, Phil, for that. Um, you know that that makes a lot of sense. The question that I'm going to pose is, you know, in the context of mainframe, you know, you talked about uh, the time-tested workflows and and the fact that there's a you know a, a, a sea change happening where we've got you know um, people retiring and new people coming in. Uh, so the question that I'm going to pose is that uh, whether or not there's a way to modernize um, those those uh, those workflows for that next generation of developers, but at the same time do it without disrupting, uh, you know, everything by having to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and create new automation. And and in fact, as people may be coming on board, we still have a significant number of um, you know traditional mainframe uh, developers who prefer working in green screen. So you know, is there a way to, to modernize without disrupting their, their workflows? And the answer here is yes. So we have something we've been calling um, modernizing in place, uh, also known as risk managed moder modernization. And it's really built on the idea that we can take some of these newer technologies and use them as interfaces to the, um, to the other uh, pieces that have been in place for many, many years, including the automation that's been in place. So just a sample of some of the uh, enabling technologies here, um, we have something called the Bridge for Git, which allows you to take a, an Endeavor repository, which is you know, similar to, to what you would now manage these days in a Git repository, and synchronize it to that Git repository so that if you prefer to use you know, green screen interfaces, by all means, you can connect directly in the green screen to Endeavor, or if you prefer to use um, you know, Git as your as your driving um, interface for making code changes. You can work that way, and then the the um, changes are synchronized back and forth, and and conflicts and, and collaboration are dealt with. Um, we also have something called Zoe CLI, 
Um, Zoe CLI is um, part of an open source project called Zoe um, for ZOS. And in particular, Zoe CLI lets you invoke off-host uh, commands that run um, operations on the mainframe itself or on host. Uh, so essentially, you can take the things like uh, GitHub Actions and make calls with that into the existing mainframe automation and maybe even supp supplement it with things that we didn't do traditionally in the past, like uh, static application analysis for the source code. Um, we also uh, have something called code for z which is an IDE extension pack, which we're going to be seeing today in the context of code spaces, but really enables um, some of the mo more modern IDEs based on VS Code to work uh, with mainframe by having the ability to interact with the operating system through a, a, an extension called Zoe Explorer, or by having things like a COBOL language, um, language support when you're doing editing of COBOL code and so on. And then lastly, we've also got a component um, called Team Build, which is part of our Endeavor um, product umbrella but really, the idea behind Team Build is to take, uh, you know, for that for those applications where you want to kind of move into a more, let's say, native approach of working for Git without having kind of this synchronization between, say, a tool like Endeavor and and, and a Git repository. It lets you basically take that um, that build automation you would have had in Endeavor and use it outside of Endeavor um, with uh, native Git repositories and so on. So basically. Um, we provide a way to either work in kind of this hybrid mode or through a more native flow. And actually, let's have a quick look at what that looks like. So in terms of a hybrid scenario, like I said, you could imagine um, a next generation developer who maybe wants to access code that's been managed in Endeavor. Um, and maybe that next generation developer is part of a team with some traditional developers. Or maybe the application that they're going to work on is part of a big application monolith. And so... Um, you know, that developer doesn't necessarily want to have kind of a self-contained build. Um, they they want to use the existing automation and structure, but really work on their part of the code. Um, for that, they can use Bridge for Git, which will essentially take Endeavor, synchronize it to an enterprise Git repo, so something like a, a GitHub repo. And then, you know, if I prefer to use, say, ISPF or even some of the um, older Eclipse interfaces that we have directly to Endeavor, by all means, you can use that. But if you want to use a tool like GitHub to collaborate along with all the value that brings around things like pull requests, code reviews, and so on, then I can absolutely do that. And of course, I can natively connect in with any Git compliant IDE. So I can use VS Code, but even better now, as we'll see in, in today's demo, I can, I can even or go having to set anything up on my desktop and just use a tool like Codespaces that spins up a, a working uh, developer environment in, in minutes. Um, and of course, as we'll see in the demo, you can have those um, Codespaces um, work areas pre-configured with your tools. So things like Zoe CLI and so on. And behind the scenes, uh, of course, uh, Endeavor can continue to use the automation for um, you know, building and shipping the code. So that, that's what we call the hybrid scenario, and it's kind of a low-cost, low-risk approach to modernization. But you know, in the Endeavor world, we also recognize that people are moving towards you know, a, a future where you know, Git platforms kind of run a lot of these things. They still need to build. They still have a, a lot of automation that is there, but they want to decouple it or couple it more loosely with, um, with these enterprise Git platforms. And so for that, we have what we call our, our Git native scenario. And essentially, the idea here is, is the same as before, except that you know, there is no hybrid, so to speak, uh, with an ISPF interface, unless you're, you're counting, say, an ISPF interface to Git uh, itself. But basically, you would be using, say, GitHub and maybe a Codespaces IDE. And then you would be doing your build and ship um, on the mainframe using team build. Um, but rather than relying on synchronizing to, uh, you know, an Endeavor managed repository, you would actually be cloning um, from GitHub onto the mainframe uh, or even your working directory or a CI workspace and then using team build to build that code um, through a mirrored build area on the mainframe. So, uh, you know, the idea of having this kind of all under the Endeavor umbrella is you get to choose what fits where. So maybe if you have some teams that are ready for this step, they can be using team build. If you've got other teams, maybe they're, they're using app monoliths or the team's not quite ready or only some of the members on the team want to use Git, you can use um, the, low, the low risk modernize in place approach. And in fact, you can even combine them, uh, which is actually what we're going to see in the demo I'm about to do with um, Phil. 
So just a, a little bit of a setup. What we're going to do is I'm going to play the role of a next gen developer who wants to make a change. Phil is going to be our, our lead developer who's going to be assigning things and doing the code reviews and whatnot. Um, but essentially, I am going to work with a kind of a scenario that shows both team build and bridge for Git. And the scenario is that whilst we have our Endeavor um, build all set up and it's wired into our, our change control, so I, I do my production builds through Endeavor, um, I, uh, as a, as a next gen developer, want to be able to build my working directory without reliance on Endeavor and where it's installed. In fact, maybe I want to do that on a virtual, uh, LPAR like ZDNT. Um, and so that's why I'm going to be using team build to build, do my developer build, my working directory build, but then we'll still be using, uh, Endeavor via, uh, in this case, GitHub actions to drive our production build. So that's the demo we're going to do. So let's, uh, let's jump in. So let me um, switch off the PowerPoints and jump over to my screen. And OK, so just a, as we can see here, I've got a um, GitHub repository uh, called Slick Oil, Tool, to, Slick Oil 2. And basically, this is the code um, for a fictitious home heating oil company. And that um, heating oil company basically has a, a Kix uh, vSAM application that manages you know, their customer accounts and records deliveries and so on. In fact, it's, uh, it's over here. So hopefully everybody can see that. This is, uh, this is my, my, my test environment my de de for my development. And uh, ultimately, all the changes that I ne need to make to that Kix uh, vSAM application can be done via um, my GitHub repository. Now. This repository has been set up with Bridge for Git to synchronize to Endeavor on designated branches. Uh, in my case, it's the main branch. But um, you know, if I want to be able to work on this, say in a code space, and I want to build, you know, what I'm working on in the code space, I, I've also got these team build scripts as shown here. So this build Z script is a team build script, and we'll we'll show how I can actually build my working directory with team build. But then when I merge onto this main branch, it's really going to be sent to Endeavor for a quote unquote production build. So that's kind of the scenario. And uh, so we'll go ahead and kick off the, um, the, the, the use case. And I can see over here that I've got an issue. So let's go have a look. It looks like Phil as the lead developer has assigned an issue to me. And it says to update the text for, for account updated. Uh, so that's a message I know that we get when back when we do things like deliveries uh, and record deliveries in our home heating oil kicks vSAM application. So, okay, I, uh, I've got this, um, this code. Let's actually, before I go and do the actual change, let's just have a look at what that application is returning right now so that we have kind of a baseline for what I'm, what I'm updating. So if I go to our application over here, this is our, our home heating oil account update screen. And we can see that I've got a um, uh, ability to record a delivery. And of course, in, in the real world these days, of course, all these green screen interfaces have got um, REST APIs and, and web front ends. But for my purposes, you know, that exists, but I'm just testing through the green screen app because uh, it's easier for me to have everything kind of self-contained on that, on that um, mainframe where I'm working. So anyways, I'm going to go and I'm going to hit F2. I'm going to go ahead and record a delivery. So we'll go do that. I'll give this, uh, this a customer. Uh, 20 gallons of, of oil, foam heating oil, and I'll record the delivery and we can see. Okay, so it comes back with this account updated successfully message. Okay, so that, fair enough. That's what it's doing now. And uh, Phil wants me to update it. He didn't say exactly what he wants me to update it to, but I'm going to go ahead and take a gallon so that he just doesn't sure if it's a customer account or something else. So maybe I'll put customer account updated successfully as my message. All right, so, uh, so given that, um, you know, I could potentially do a clone of this to my laptop and, uh, you know, start setting up my development environment. But in my case, I don't have to do that because I've got code spaces as set, is all set up uh, to work in this repo. And I can actually spin up a development environment on demand from over here. So over here, I've got actually a code space set up. So I'm just going to launch this guy and we'll see what it looks like. So you can see it's setting up the code space. It's starting up the the containers behind it. This can take a few seconds, and then uh, it will launch me into it, and I'll be able to um, start coding without having to do all of the different setup activities I would have done 
if I was setting up this locally. So for instance, I would have had to install Zoe CLI maybe and then set up all my profiles in Zoe CLI and uh, then download and install VS Code and then add in all those code for Z extensions and all that fun stuff. Well, I didn't have to do any of that. I just click that button and look at this. I've got a, a development uh, area that I can work in um, with all the tools I need, including the code. And uh, I can go ahead and start uh, creating my change. So, so, uh, so given that, um, the first thing that I should probably do is create a feature branch to work on. Of course, uh, these days you want to make sure that you're keeping your changes in isolation. Uh, a branch for each change that makes uh, that ensures you don't get your code intermingled with other in-flight work. So I'll go ahead and do that. I've got a plugin uh, in Code Spaces because uh, Code Spaces is Git native. It's connected right to Git, uh, and I can go in here and use the checkout to option to create a branch. So we'll call this branch, um, well, we'll call it, how about Git Webinar? Sounds like a good branch name to me. So I'll go ahead and create the new branch from there. And you can see down here that I'm on that new branch. And that's it. I'm on a branch in isolation in, uh, in my, my code space environment, and I can start making changes. So let's go back to the, to the files. Now you can see this is a clone of my GitHub repo. I've got all the files that were there. Um, the actual COBOL code that I'm working with is in the slick folder. And you'll notice this folder structure here, slick, slick, and then uh, what looks like uh, different types of code. This is actually corresponding to um, inventory organizations inside of Endeavor. Uh, so, you know, basically this structure is imposed from having this repository mapped to Endeavor via bridge for Git. Uh, it will only synchronize the stuff that is in this folder structure and that is set up for mapping. Uh, so I can have other things in there. Like for instance, I've got my dev container file. If I, if I had any tests or anything like that I wanted to run, I could have those. I've also got my team build scripts and so on. But this is essentially that source code that I need to change. So uh, if I go down here, now I happen to know that that message is in a module called Slick PD. So I'm gonna click on here and open it. And the first thing uh, I'm going to call your attention to is you can see over here that this COBOL um, uh, editor that launched uh, is aware of COBOL syntax. And uh, that's part of those extensions that get installed into my code space from uh, VS Code called code for z uh, So one of the things in there is a COBOL language uh, support e um, editor. And it has all the capabilities you expect, syntax highlighting. I can even do things like come in here and you know, peek at data structures or if I want. I can even open this up and see, you know, the COBOL copy book where this thing came from and so on. Um, so there's all sorts of features in here that help uh, it make it easy to work with COBOL. Um, but uh, I, I know pretty much exactly what I need to do. There's that message uh, that we had, account updated uh, successfully. So I'm going to go ahead and let's update that to customer account updated successfully. Not super exciting but nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, it's a change. So anyways, so we now have this pending change. You can see that um, the, the plugin uh, for Git um, has flagged this as modified. Okay, so essentially I've made that change in my code space, in my working directory. I have not committed this, however, and it is not up on the um, GitHub uh, repository to be shared with anyone at this point in time. It's just sitting locally on my code spaces um, you know, on a, on a, on, on a branch and uh, called GitHub webinar. And um, now if I want to see, you know, obviously if I want to make sure this works before I, I send it in and, and send it over to Endeavor for a production build, you know, I need to be able to build my working directory. So uh, there's many different ways to do that, but the one we're going to talk about today so that we can get a flavor of this new component in Endeavor called team build. Uh, is, is basically I'm going to use that team build uh, component to build this working directory. Now, the way it works is it has a bunch of different um, pieces to it. Um, the first one uh, is called sync Z. So sync Z allows me to essentially take a directory anywhere, including in this code space or maybe even in a CI uh, workspace, you know, one managed by, by something like GitHub Actions or, or something similar. But basically using sync Z, I can define uh, a corresponding location out on a mainframe where I can synchronize whatever changes are pending there. 
It doesn't require you to be committed or anything like that. It's basically just creating a mirror in what I'd call my mainframe build area. Uh, and it just uses SSH um, to connect, synchronize uh, the directory uh, and basically create a mirror of whatever I'm working on. And then I have another component called BuildZ, which actually takes the build scripts like the ones defined here and invokes a build. So to do a build of my working directory, I can use a single command, which I'll, I'll, I'll do in a second. There's another, there's, well, there's really two other pieces to team build. Um, the first one I'll mention is export Z. And what that does is it, I, I mentioned that, you know, I, I've got this kind of separate build that I can run pretty much outside the Endeavor environment. But of course, I don't want to have to create that build manually. I can take my existing build logic in Endeavor and run uh, export Z and it will create a team build script for me that basically represents the build logic that would have happened in Endeavor. So using that, I can uh, very seamlessly create, uh, you know, a, a team, a build for the teams to do building builds of their working directories, check it in the repo. Um, so that's a one-time run, but it, it allows me to do this very simply and easily um, without having to write scripts manually. And then the other piece is uh, there's a capability to export to binary repositories like Artifactory or, or Sonotype or things like that. So if you wanted to, you know, as part of your overall process, move uh, these things to a binary repo, you can. Uh, in my case, I'm not going to use that. I'm actually just going to merge onto the designated main branch and it's going to send the code uh, to Endeavor. Okay, so that's kind of team build in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and execute this command that I'm talking about that will build my working directory. So to do that, I simply issue sync Z uh, and then that's going to run the sync. And then I'm going to specify dash A and I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell it to invoke build Z, and we'll, we'll look at this command in a second. So after I've done the synchronization, I want it to invoke build Z on this SRC directory, which you can see in my YAML file was defined up here. So basically I'm saying synchronize the code and then build that same code that you synced. Uh, and that dash dash proc one just basically says to single thread the build. You can actually have a multi-threaded build and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. It's connecting using SSH and it needs my password. So I'll go ahead and put that in. By the way, I could use certificate-based authentication if preferred um, and uh, you know any other SSH things. Okay, so what did I, oh, looks like I have a typo in there. Let me fix that. Uh, there we go. Try that one more time and password one more time. And basically again, it's gonna synchronize. By the way, you'll notice this time it's up to date. So it's synced but it didn't invoke the build, um, but now it's up invoking the build. And very, very quickly, we're completed. So one of the reasons that was very, very quick is you'll notice all of this up-to-date, up-to-date. When I did that build, I said, essentially, there's a, there's a flag I could have passed that would have said, like, do a full rebuild, but I didn't pass that. So essentially, it only built what needed to be built. And since I only updated Slick PD, that's all it built. Let's say I had updated a copy book, though. Uh, and I had a whole bunch of modules dependent on that. If I had done that, then it would have rebuilt all the dependent modules, okay? So I was able to just like that, do a build of my working directory. And uh, now I wanna essentially test this. So I'm gonna copy it in to my, um, my, my development kicks region. And of course I mentioned I can do this. And in fact, we will see this being done through a pipeline, but in my case, I'm just gonna do a really quick uh, manual test. And uh, I have an actual script here that I've created and it's leveraging Zoe to take the things that I've updated and bring them to the Kix region. You can even look at the script and then just do a quick new copy on it. Okay, so by doing that, I can actually um, build, take this code that we rebuilt and bring it to a live Kix region for testing. Okay, so I'll go ahead and execute the script. And you can see, it's, by the way, it's using my Zoe profile to do all my connections. Um, but we should see in a sec a message coming back. There we go. So that's a message indicating the file was copied and then it did a new copy. Uh, for the non-mainframe programmers out there, a new copy is just a way of saying, hey, Kix region, the code that I, the, the module I updated is uh, new and you need to reload it. So that's essentially um, what I did. And I did that all inside of my, um, my code space. So now all that's left is to run a quick manual test and then we'll go ahead and go with the rest of the flow. So. Let me pop back over to my environment where I had my, my account updated successfully. And this time I'm gonna go ahead and re-invoke that delivery. We'll do another delivery of 20 gallons of oil and I would expect I see a different message this time. 
and there we go. Customer account updated successfully. So hopefully that makes Phil happy with his issue. Let's, uh, I think we're ready to go ahead and uh, push this and create a pull request. And then we can see the CI side of, of, of all of this. So I'm gonna go back into my code space where I have my, my Git extension. I'll put in a, a nice little message here. We'll say webinar update, and I'll go ahead and commit that. And uh, it's telling me I should stage. So yeah, why not? Let's stage. And then you'll see that I have a, it knows that I've got some changes out on a local branch that I maybe want to publish. And what do you know? I do want to publish that. So I'm going to go ahead and click that button and it's going to publish it back to GitHub. And if we go to GitHub, you can see here's our, our branch that just got changed. And of course, uh, you know, GitHub is smart enough to know that uh, I probably want a pull request to get that branch onto the main branch. Uh, so that I can do my production build, right? What I just did was a build of my working directory just to do a little bit of manual testing, but I actually have driven my GitHub Actions a whole um, you know, continuous integration pipeline set up around this, and we have processes that protect the, um, the main branch to make sure you know, my change goes through code review, and uh, Phil's gonna look at that, uh, and so on. And we also wanna make sure my builds don't you know, fail and, and get deployed out. So there's all sorts of these these um, checks that are associated with that main branch. So we're gonna see uh, uh, that process when I create the pull request. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a pull request and I'm gonna add Phil as a reviewer. And there we go, Phil's all set to review my pull request and I'm gonna go ahead and create this. Now, once I do that, first of all, you'll notice I cannot merge it. And the reason I cannot merge it is because I have these steps that need to pass. So for instance, I need Phil to complete his code review and make sure that my change is good. I also need to make sure that I have a, a good solid build and that build also in, invokes tests and things like that. So that build has to pass before I can merge onto the main branch. Um, so until those things happen, I'm not gonna be able to merge this. So let's, uh, let's see how Phil's uh, going with his, with his code review here. I'm gonna go ahead and re 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 this. And I, I'm a stickler, so one thing I did while Vaughn was doing that is I updated his uh, initial message there to make sure that we're closing out that issue when we merge that pull request. So we don't even have to worry about that silly little ticket I created with vague instructions around what is uh, what is expected from that message. Uh, yes, definitely. Thanks, Phil. I always forget that, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> okay. So it's all good. All right, so it looks like uh, Phil has uh, approved the changes, and uh, so that's great. So now all we need to do is get through this CI build, and you can see it's actually been running while we've been talking. This is using GitHub Actions, and uh, it's actually using uh, the container with um, Zoe CLI installed into it, and using Zoe CLI, it's making calls out to Endeavor to do things like build. In fact, let's have a look over here. You can see an example of this, right? So running build, uh, you can actually, I think, open that up and see the Zoe commands that it's invoking, right? So I'm building the COBOL types and then I'm, I'm running the links. So anything that changed that's sitting in Endeavor that got synced, it would get rebuilt. Uh, and, then, and then it's running a deploy, which is really just submitting a, a, a job to update things. Uh, it's running tests and, and then packaging things up. So, uh, and in fact, it has gone ahead and completed, right? So. It was a successful CI run. So I would expect when I go back to this um, pull request, I will be able to merge this now because I've gotten through all the different checks. And uh, as expected, this button is now green and lit up and I, go, I can go ahead and merge this. And then that's gonna kick off whatever process you have to take that updated merged main branch onto uh, a production build and, and out to the end user. So, you know, all very much a modern process, um, you know, that allows developers to work kind of in a, in a low risk approach with existing builds. But you can also see that um, using team build for the apps that are ready for it, I am actually able to work natively in Git as well, or I can use the two in combination. It really is up to, you know, the app and the team. And that is one of the main things. So when we talk about this kind of um, risk managed um, modernization, it's not just about, you know, choosing, uh, you know, a, a strategy for everyone that's based on, on one set of conditions, but really being able to make the decisions in a, in a um, you know, a, in, in a, a slowly over time on a, on a team by team, app by app basis, 
Um, some things might be suited for Git native, some things might be better uh, approached, maybe things like monoliths and whatnot through a hybrid workflow, and you can combine them. I could, for instance, have the copy books being managed on the green screen, and I can use a tool like Bridge for Git to inject those copy books through a submodule into my app's repo. So there's all sorts of different ways to do it. And the main thing is you've got all the tools that you need to, uh, to choose the workflows uh, that, that, that make the most sense for your team and then evolve them over time. Anyways, let's go ahead and, and uh, merge this pull request. And then of course, uh, that should in fact take the um, issue and close it. So if we come in here, we see I no longer have any open issues. Um, it's been closed out because Phil reminded me I need to put that comment in. So thank you very much, Phil. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, Happy to. let's yeah, no problem. So that's it for the demonstration. Let's pop back over to my deck and uh, I just want to summarize kind of what we saw and then, then we'll open it up for questions. So, you know, in summary, as, as you can see, mainframe modernization is very much something that is on the minds of uh, many practitioners, especially with this wave of, you know, retiring uh, traditional mainframers, but you know, it's not something that you should take lightly. You know, it is very critical, uh, mission critical apps. Disruption is not a good idea in this space. So a risk managed modernization strategy is, is important. You want to make sure that, you know, if you are going to do lift and shift and do things like get native um, workflows, you don't try and boil the ocean. You do it when and where it makes sense. You leverage uh, existing investments in automations. And, you know, if you want to improve those, extend them, even replace them over time. It's not a manage. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of trying to get it all done in, you know, one, one big go. It, it, it's done in a measured approach. Uh, and by doing that, you, uh, you, you are managing your risk. And at the same time, you know, demonstrating to your new hires, to, to the people that, you know, are going to become that next generation of mainframers that, hey, mainframe is not what you think it is. I mean, you can use these modern tools, you can build a career here, you know, you can build a specialized skill set in mainframe, which, you know, is a good thing. Um, you know, it, it's not it's not what you think it is where you're going to go and you're going to use a bunch of old tools and you won't know how to use Git or you won't know how to use, you know, Git platforms because you're there. That's not the case at all. Um, it's a very vital, vibrant and uh, exciting place to build a career. So. Um, so that's kind of it. And uh, apart from that, I will ask uh, Cody if we've got any questions. So we've got a couple questions, but I want to, um, while we are addressing these few that just came in, please continue to send your questions in as we go through these. We've got plenty of time to address as many as you can send in. So let's start with the first one. And uh, this person asks, can you use team build in a pipeline to build a dev branch to check for problems? Yep, that's a, I guess a, a question for me. Um, so the answer is absolutely. So I guess, you know, what we saw in the demo today was me using team build, um, you know, on, on in my code space uh, to build a working directory, which is great. You know, that, that means I can, I can uh, build almost like I was building on my laptop. Um, you know, obviously, yes, I need a mainframe, but it's, it, it's not constrained by all of the, you know, infrastructure of Endeavor. So if I had, for instance, a zd &T instance, I could, I could build there with a very easy um, team build um, deployment, which, by the way, is just a couple of binaries that you would put in your um, USS home directory. Um, but hey, could I, could I do that same thing in a CI workspace? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, as long you, you would have a few different choices. So for instance, if you had, uh, a, a agent or something on, um, Z itself, then you can invoke team build directly. But even if you don't have that, um, you can simply install sync Z, uh, inside, um, your, your CI workspace and use it, do a git clone or, or git checkout or git fetch. And then, uh, use sync Z to invoke, invoke the build on the corresponding um, build area that's associated with the, with the CI workspace. So yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Awesome. So our second question that we received reads, uh, code spaces run in the cloud. So how can I connect to mainframe securely? 
I think uh, it sounds like it's a question for me. Uh, so code spaces are running on a network isolated VM out in the cloud. And uh, there's really kind of two connections we'll, we'll talk about here. The first is, you know, how does code spaces uh, interact, you know, with, with the mainframe? We're, we're issuing those codes, via, uh, those commands via Zoe. What's that communication path? And so when you're the pattern that we use and the pattern that a lot of our other regulated customers are using for code spaces is to define in one of the multiple containers that can be running in that code space, uh, set up a VPN client. And then that can just be VPN in the same way a developer workstation would be VPN into the network through a trusted gateway. So then the second part is, well, that communication pattern. We're, if we're issuing those Zoe commands, those Zoe commands are being issued, they're being sent over, you know, the, the uh, sent through the VPN. But then there was also that part that we saw where you know GitHub Actions was triggering that build and, and how is that happening? There's a self-hosted runner, for lack of a better term, that's running alongside the uh, the mainframe, or I'd have to actually ask Vaughn if he's actually got that running over on the uh, Unix system services side. But anyway, there's that little runner that's running alongside the mainframe, and all it's doing is making HTTPS calls out to GitHub, checking for work, basically checking the job queue. When there's a job, it runs the job locally, and then it just sends the results back out to GitHub via HTTPS. So again, it's the VPN connectivity for those Zoe commands to come in, but all those commands that are being executed, everything else is all happening locally uh, behind the network or in the local yeah. network. Yeah, and just uh, just to answer the question, it's actually uh, beside the mainframe communicating with USS, yes, but not running on USS. Perfect. Um, our third question reads, you showed a couple different ways to build. When should we use one over the other? Okay, so I think that one's for me. And uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, and, and of course, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I guess the question is, what does it depend on? Um, it, it, it really, there's a number of different factors. So I'll cite some of them. And uh, I'm sure this is not an exhaust exhaustive uh, list. There's probably things that, that could come up, different use cases, et cetera. Um, you know, we'll start with the obvious one. You know, I'm on a team. Uh, I'm a new hire maybe uh, to mainframe or, or maybe I've come from a, a, the distributed world and I want to maybe start building some mainframe knowledge, uh, you know, between, around doing some full stack development or something like that. But the you know the rest of the team or the or the core developers on the on the application on the mainframe application are perhaps um, very senior um, you know developers who have worked in mainframe for many many years and and are very um, you know used to using 3270 quite comfortable there and in fact probably more comfortable there than than they they see no real reason to necessarily. Um, switch over to working in a different way. They, they, for them, this is the most productive way to work, right, in 3270. So if I've got a team make, made up like that, you know, um, that's probably a good good reason to use something like Bridge for Git, right, where I can collaborate with those people without disrupting them, but at the same time, I can use the tools and environment I'm familiar with. Uh, another example might be, you know, I work on a mainframe uh, monolith. So for those that are not sure what I mean by that, you know, in the, in the days uh, past when we had these big applications that ran on mainframe very frequently, um, you know, they were just one big application, even though they had many different um, functions. And sometimes in those cases, the boundaries between what's, what's one app versus another are, you know, are, are very fuzzy. Um, and maybe even the knowledge around that is, is, has already retired. Um, if that's the case, it can be difficult to figure out what goes in a repo um, to, to essentially run, create a team build around. Um, and you can deal with that, again, using a tool like Bridge for Git by um, you know, essentially mapping just the files you're working on, but letting the dependencies for builds come from existing automation um, up and, and files that are up not being modified that are up in production. Um, but you know, hey, and where, where might I decide I want to use team build? Team build uh, could be used, for instance, if you want to um, be 100% Git native. Let's say you want to just use all these tools. The whole team wants to use Git. Uh, you're going to use you know, a CI tool to, to run the build, so you don't need the Endeavor automation. And um, then if that's the case, you can use team build. If, the, if you, there's no monolith involved or, or you know where the application boundaries 
um, should lie. Team build can be the, the answer there. Um, it can also be very helpful if you want to do things like I showed developer builds um, without reliance on Endeavor infrastructure. So situations where that may come up, uh, for instance, would be if you're using a tool like uh, ZDNT, which allows you to essentially virtualize uh, an LPAR, a mainframe uh, LPAR, and run it on a x86 host. Um, so you can spin up, you know, development environments or test environments. So let's say you want to build something there. Maybe you have a development VM, or maybe you're you're using, uh, you know, ZDNT in the context uh, as one of your um, code space containers. If that's the case, um, and you want to build on it. Um, team build uh, doesn't require the same kind of infrastructure, um, and it is more suitable to work in those types of environments. So those are just a few of the, the different data points that would help you maybe decide, but really it, it's all about looking at the application and its particular needs and then, and then deciding which thing makes the most sense to pursue. And of course, um, you know, they're all under the Endeavor umbrella. So, you know, consider it um, one of many tools in a toolkit. So that was a, that was a great question and a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for that in-depth answer. Um, it looks like right now we have one more question. Um, so they ask, the connection made towards mainframe is done via Zoe, or is there another special method used? Yeah, that's uh, I, maybe I'll take that one. Um, so the answer is both. Um, so we'll start with the special method. I don't know if I would call it special, but um, the first thing that we saw where I interacted with mainframe in the demo was me running a build of my working directory. Um, so I made that connection to the mainframe through um, Secure Shell, which was essentially um, being driven by SyncZ, which remember is a, is a tool built on top of Secure Shell that specifically synchronizes and mirrors directories. So I took my, in my case, my working directory, I mirrored it to um, to the mainframe, in this case, Unix system services. And then after the mirroring, I invoked a, a mainframe process called BuildZ to do the build. So that was the, the first thing that we saw. But then later, when I merged onto the main branch uh, and, that, and created the pull request, that kicked off a continuous integration build that was effectively taking the code that got synced through Bridge for Git to Endeavor and driving the Endeavor build. And for that, I used Zoe CLI. Um, so Zoe CLI was installed into my, into my um, container that was running the GitHub Actions, and it essentially the, it was just invoking Zoe CLI commands to drive the Endeavor build. So we kind of actually saw two different ways of interacting with the mainframe. Excellent. Um, it looks like we got another question in. And um, they ask, what kind of hardware would be needed to set up structures like the demo showed? Ah, that's a, uh, I'll that's cover a the question. first, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll cover the first say. half of that and then toss it over for for the other half. From from the GitHub perspective, really, all you need is any any laptop with a modern web browser. Uh, the modern web browser is, you know, you can drive your code space directly through uh, through the browser and not have to rely on any any desktop hardware other than that. From the second part of the GitHub side, what we saw was the GitHub Actions workflow kick off that build on Endeavor via Zoe. And with that, you would need one or more, depending upon the size and scale of your, your mainframe deployment, how many applications you have, how much you're going to run them. Uh, a, a Linux runner alongside or running in Unix system services on the mainframe that would communicate with GitHub, run the Zoe commands, get the results back from the job, and then return those to GitHub. Yeah. And on the mainframe side, you know, in terms of the hardware, we were we were interacting with an LPAR. Uh, that LPAR, in our case, was not virtual, but it could be virtual, right? So uh, just a, a regular LPAR, and and really, there's no special requirements on that LPAR um, other than you know what you would need to run uh, the components there. Um, if you're just doing the builds and the builds aren't that complex, you know, it can be lightweight. If it's if it's something that where you need a lot of juice, you can. Uh, in our case, you know, for instance, we had a development um, uh, Kix region set up. So I was running Kix, obviously, and I had that region up and running and things like that. But those are more app-specific needs. Uh, 
Well, that looks like it has exhausted our questions. So I'll go ahead and announce our gift card winners and just give everyone maybe a last minute to uh, get any questions in that they might have. Um, so Phil and Vaughn, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, our four Amazon gift card winners. So these are four $25 gift cards. Our first one is Milton H. Our second winner is Ellen S. Our third winner is Dirk T. And our fourth winner is Pedro L. So congratulations to the four of you. Um, you should receive that gift card in your email inbox, but if you don't see it, um, keep an eye on your checks, on your spam folder. All right. Um, Seeing no more questions at this point in time, would you guys, do you guys have anything you'd like to say before we close out? Any closing remarks? Um, I'll, maybe I'll go first. I'll, I don't know if you can see the call to action here on our Q&A slide, but uh, we actually have a um, blog site on Medium, medium.com slash modern dash mainframe. Uh, if you go there, you can find a ton of content on you know, modernization, the different approaches, using things like bridge for Git, using things like team build. A lot of the content is very technical and how to. So it's really it's meant for developers to look at and figure out how do I get started? Or maybe you're a DevOps um, COE type and you're you're thinking about doing a pilot. It's a great sp spot to find information, not just on Git and Endeavor, but actually on modern mainframe approaches across the board from security to you know, uh, you know, using different IDEs and mainframe languages and how do you de debug and all sorts of great content. So I would highly recommend anybody who's kind of starting out on that uh, modernization journey, consider this a key resource. Uh, apart from that, I would just uh, thank Phil, um, you know, for his participation and, and everybody for their attendance. Uh, Phil, I don't know if you had any um, parting words. <laughs> and for, really, this to me, this is really exciting. Um, you know, we've always focused on improving the developer experience, and now we finally have a way in you know a partnership with, with Broadcom and with open tools like Zoe to create a, a uniform developer experience, no matter what language you're developing in or what target you're deploying to, whether it's mobile, whether it's des uh, desktop, whether it's a server app, or whether it's mainframe. We can use the same tools and practices for each of them. And to me, that this makes it a really exciting time. Uh, if you want to learn more about code spaces, uh, you can jump into GitHub and just start using it today if you wish. Feel free to reach out to me at GitHub if you have any kind of GitHub or code spaces specific things. Other than that, thanks to, to Vaughn and to Broadcom and to, to our partners here hosting the webinar today and for all of you to, uh, who came out to listen to us. Awesome. Phil and Vaughn, thank you so much. Um, I want to remind today's audience that the session was recorded. Following the webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find it living on the DevOps website. So you can just visit devops.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section. Um, so again, Phil and Vaughn, stars of the day. Thank you so much for this awesome presentation, this demo. I, I know I took away a lot from it. Um, I'd also like to thank Broadcom for sponsoring today's webinar. And my final thanks goes to you, our audience, for being with us for the entirety of today's presentation. This is Cody J. Brown signing off. Have an excellent day, everyone.